So welcome. Uh, this program is called the Contemplative Study of Mystical Writings. It is a new initiative that I am launching tonight. So I'm thankful that you all could join me. This is very exciting. My name is Carl McCormick, if you, if you don't already know me. And um, this is actually something that I have been praying about and thinking about since before the pandemic. So, um, so this has been a, a while in coming, but, um, but tonight we actually are going to launch it and I wanna share with you about it and about the vision that I have for a program that will begin uh, in just a few weeks in February of 2022. So I'll share just a little bit about me to kind of get us oriented. And then uh, we're gonna spend some time, I just want to share with you some information about a classic mystical book with a surprising title. Many of you already know the book that I'm going to be discussing. And I mean, if you don't, you're gonna find out in just a few minutes. And that will be um, a lead in then to talking more about this initiative, this contemplative study of mystical writings program, giving you an overview of my vision for this program. And then obviously we'll, we'll end with an invitation for participation. So I'm hoping that uh, even if you decide you don't wanna participate in a longer program, that, that the material that I share with you tonight will be of interest. Hopefully it will be a blessing for you. And, um, and of course, I hope that if you feel called to take a deeper dive uh, with me and with some other folks that, that you'll consider doing that. So again, my name is Carl, Carl McCullman. That is uh, not the best picture ever taken of me, but I realized I don't have a new headshot. These glasses are brand new. I just got them about two weeks ago. So on my to-do list is to get a new headshot, but there you go. So um, many of you may know me from the podcast that I co-host, Encountering Silence, with my dear friends, uh, Kevin Johnson and Cassidy Hall. We've been doing that podcast now for over three years and have had uh, just some amazing conversations with a number of wonderful people. So it's also been a wonderful way for me to connect with people. You may also know me, I mean, even longer, even before the podcast, I have been a blogger. My blog is www.anamkara.com. And um, I registered that domain name back in 1996, believe it or not, 25 years ago, it's hard to believe, but that's, that's why I have such a cool domain name. And I've um, and been blogging not quite that long, but almost that long. And, um, but to, to begin to tell you just a little bit about myself, I wanna share this picture. This coming May, May of 2022, will represent the 10th anniversary of me making my solemn profession as a lay Cistercian. So, okay, that's a, that's a mouthful of a word. A lay Cistercian is a lay person who is uh, an associate of a Trappist monastery, Trappist or a Cistercian monastery. In my case, it's the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers, Georgia. Those of you who are familiar with the Atlanta area, you probably know the monastery. If you don't, I hope you will get to know it soon. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. And, um, and I'm just, I just feel really honored that it has become a spiritual home for me. Uh, as a lay associate, I'm kind of part of the monk's extended family. I don't live at the monastery, I am married, I am a lay person, quote unquote, but I have this incredible bond with the monastery. And, um, and hopefully you'll see why I wanted to share that with you as we get into the material we're gonna be talking about tonight. I thought it might be fun to again, briefly share a little bit of my story through books. So I've got just a couple of books, book covers on this slide that will hopefully give you a sense of me. And so the story begins with Evelyn Underhill's book, Mysticism, right after my graduation from high school, back when God was a boy, uh, I had a, a dream about the world coming to an end. And I shared that story with a friend of mine, a few years older than me, and he gives me a copy of this book. Mysticism by Evelyn Underhill. The book he gave me looks just like this cover. I think it is just the ugliest book cover ever. Do not judge a book by its cover. This is exhibit A because the book itself is luminous. It was written in 1911. Uh, it, is, it is a look at the mystical tradition, primarily of Christianity, although she does draw from other traditions as well. And so reading this book as a young person, it opened my eyes to the riches of the Western uh, contemplative mystical tradition, the deep spiritual tradition 
of the of, of Christianity and then of, of other faiths as well, but primarily Christianity. Then when I was in college, uh, a professor of mine recommended that I read a book called The Seven Story Mountain by Thomas Merton. I know many of you are familiar with this book as well. Merton, of course, a Trappist monk, the same kind of monk as the monastery that I'm affiliated with, and really one of the great lights of 20th century spirituality. So if Evelyn Underhill helped me to see that there was this tradition of deep spirituality, uh, Merton helped me to see that it is a living tradition, that, that in the 20th century, there are still people, men, women, people who are um, em embodiments of that, that amazing, amazing tradition. And then uh, when I was in graduate school, it's like these different stages of my life, uh, I began to take classes. I, I did my graduate work at George Mason University in Virginia. And I, did my I started to do some spiritual work of an organization called the Shalem Institute. And one of the leaders of the Shalem Institute at that time, he has since passed away, uh, was uh, Dr. Gerald May, who has written a number of books, but uh, he's best known for Addiction and Grace. But this book, Will and Spirit, again, was one of those books that just opened up a whole new vista for me. Will and Spirit, the, the subtitle is A Contemplative Psychology. And so this was a book that really kind of, you know, drilled down into how contemplative spirituality, mystical spirituality can be a healing presence in our lives, in our psyches, in our, in our, our hearts. And so reading this book really for me, not only represented uh, an invitation into my own wellness, but also a real recognition of the ongoing vitality of this wonderful tradition. But I also want to mention that Evelyn Underhill really helped me to, to plug in to the, the mystics of old. And so the book I picked to, to represent that was Julian of Norwich. Julian of Norwich, who lived in the 1300s, uh, pr probably of all the great Christian mystical writers, has long been my favorite. Amazing, optimistic woman who spoke of the love of God, of the motherhood of God. Of, of God as not having any wrath whatsoever, but simply being this, this infinite, vast embodiment of, of love and grace, which was very, very important for me, having grown up with kind of a stern image of God. My image of God began to heal with, with reading Julian Norwich. And finally, the last book that I want to share with you, I'm really honored and humbled to share with you a book that I myself have written, uh, just through grace, I have had the opportunity to become a writer and to be published. And so my book, The Big Book of Christian Mysticism, published in 2010, in many ways was my homage, my thank you letter to Evelyn Underhill and to these other people, that their, their writing, their wisdom had been such a gift to me that I wanted to say thank you. And what better way to do it than with my own feeble attempt to write a book about this spirituality that I love so much. So the reason why I wanted to share these books with you is because I love books. I'm a book nerd. I admit it, a bookworm. I, I skulk around and use bookstores like it's nobody's business. And, um, and it's just always been an important part of me, including an important part of my spiritual life. But I also want to acknowledge that many spiritual books are not easy to read. And so in this slide, I'm just going to share a few books. Some of you may be familiar with these. And you probably would agree with me that these are not easy books. They're not the kind of books you take to the beach. They, uh, they represent a usually rather, um, rather deep philosophy, uh, profound theology, often very psychologically nuanced, and, um, and just really do invite us deep into our interior lives, but do it in a way that is, um, again, is, is challenging. And I mean that in a good way. It's like going to the gym is challenging. Reading these books is like a spiritual workout. Now, the last book that I, I put on the slide, again, is the book that I want to spend a little bit of time with you tonight. And that is a book, it is anonymously published, although we have a pretty good idea who the author is, but, but I'll just refer to the person as the author tonight. A book that came out around 1980 called Meditations on the Tarot. Now, immediately you might say, Huh, I thought Carl's field was Christian mysticism and, and Christian contemplative spirituality. Why are we looking at a book on the tarot? So, um, so let's, let's explore that. Let's, let's open that up a little. I was drawn to this book initially. I, I think I first encountered this book back in, 
I think in the 1990s. I was initially drawn to it because of the people who praised it and endorsed it. So I wanna very briefly go through some of those right now with you. We'll begin with Bede Griffiths, famous Benedictine monk who spent much of his life, he's from England, knew C.S. Lewis, spent much of his life in India, working deeply in Hindu Christian dialogue. He says of Meditations on the Tarot, there is hardly a line without some profound significance. To me, it is the last word in wisdom. That is high praise. A blurb like this means this author loved Meditations on the Tarot, but he wasn't the only one. Cynthia Bergeau, who I know needs no introduction, um, says Meditations on the Tarot presents a brilliant synthesis of esoteric and mystical wisdom. Thomas Keating, the great centering prayer um, teacher. This book, in my view, is the greatest contribution to date toward the rediscovery and renewal of the Christian contemplative tradition. Again, look at that superlative quality of praise. Uh, Therese Schroeder Shaker, the award-winning harpist, woman who has done incredible research on the role that music can play for people when they are in their dying process. Somebody who's actually been a guest on my podcast, really, really a lovely and deeply spiritual person, says that Meditations of Tarot is a work of staggering insight, intelligence, imagination, and service. It metabolizes diverse cultural and spiritual terrains while participating in the mystical body of Christ. It is quite simply manna in the desert. And then finally, uh, and there are more, I'm just picking a few here to share with you tonight. Basil Pennington, who uh, again, another Trappist monk, a colleague of, um, of Thomas Keating's, was actually the abbot of the monastery that I'm affiliated with, uh, says, it is without doubt the most extraordinary work I have ever read. Tremendous spiritual depth and insight. So friends, I hope that even if, you know, even if you wonder why would, why would I be interested in a book on the Tarot, I hope these endorsements will help you to see that this is something worth getting to know. This book has something to say to our generation. And so I, I, I want to explore that a little with you this evening. So that's the question. What gifts come from this book? Incidentally, these covers, these are the two editions that are currently available in, in North America. The one on the left is the paperback edition. The one on the right is a beautiful new hardcover edition. You can also get it for your Kindle. I think there are, are other ebook versions available as well. So it is a book that is easily accessible. So let's begin with a quote from scripture. Uh, from, from the Acts of the Apostles, we have this, this is when Saint Stephen is speaking before he was martyred. Um, and he's, he talks about kind of the lineage that Jesus stands in, the lineage of great spiritual leaders and teachers. And when he comes to Moses, he says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, powerful in his words and deeds. And the point I want to make here, well, there's two points. And the first is that Stephen is acknowledging that great spiritual teachers sometimes are nurtured from without the immediate tradition. Here is Moses, a, a leader of the Hebrews, the people who become what we now call the Jews, the, the people of Israel, getting his, his, his training, his spiritual formation from the world of Egypt, the world in which he grew up in. And um, what is fascinating about this is there is a mythology about the Tarot. I don't know how much truth there may be. I'm going to just acknowledge that it's, it's folklore, it's a myth, but a mythology that the tarot itself conveys through its images wisdom that goes all the way back to Egypt. Is that, is that the real deal? Is that just a charming folktale? You know, you can be the judge of that. But whatever you may think of the, of the tarot cards, I, I just want you to, to begin to think about this idea that here is a book that explores this idea that that Christianity can be in creative conversation with traditions outside of its boundaries. So the Meditations on the Tarot invites us into a spirituality of dialogue. The author draws from many sources, Christian, non-Christian, Eastern and Western, 
spiritual and secular, religious and esoteric. The, the index is just amazing to look at. I mean, saints like St. John of the Cross, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, St. Bonaventura, St. Francis of Assisi, but then also figures from other religious traditions like Swami Vivekananda or Sri Aurobindo. Again, uh, figures from the esoteric or magical tradition that he draws from scientists, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who also was a Jesuit priest. So this just this breadth of knowledge that kind of gets poured into the soup of, of the wisdom that this book presents to us. Um, just to give you one example of how he, he can makes connections that, that are insightful. He talks about the motto of Benedictine spirituality, ora et labora. Most of you may be familiar with this. It's Latin, it means prayer and work. And the idea is that a monk devotes himself or herself himself to a life of both prayer and work. But the author of Meditations on the Tarot looks at how those words get used to describe places. And he says, compare the oratory and the laboratory or the laboratory. Oratory, obviously a place of prayer, laboratory, place of scientific research. So he reinterprets Ora et Labora to say, friends, I think that the Benedictines are inviting us into a spirituality of dialogue between religion and science. Wow, that was a major insight for me. And, and, and I hope that, that you can see just, just the promise and the possibility that that way of looking at, 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 at this simple you know, motto, uh, what it invites us into. And this book is filled with these kind of nuggets of invitation of invitation into the spirituality of dialogue. Now, the author is not afraid to express criticism of some of the material he draws from, but overall, his, his, his tone is incredibly generous, incredibly kind, and really affirming of wisdom and goodness and truth wherever he finds it, which I think is, is a deeply, deeply spiritual um, posture to take. Incidentally, I should also mention these slides. You'll notice I have images from the Tarot, and it's from a specific deck. It's called the Marseille deck. And that is the deck that the author himself uses, and that's why I picked those images for these slides. The author says that the function and mission of the Tarot is to elevate the soul. It is a system of spiritual exercises. And I should, should mention right here that he does not approach the tarot in terms of divination or fortune telling or you know that kind of usage that kind of popular usage of the cards and um you know that and i mentioned that because i know that in the christian tradition there has been a tendency to see that kind of thing as off limits and um and i'm i'm also conscious that tonight on a large call like this uh, probably there are people who adhere to that kind of Christian thinking. There are probably other people who find the Tarot very helpful in their own spiritual life. So I want to be respectful of everybody's point of view, but I just want to acknowledge that this book is written out of the contemplative Christian tradition, so it doesn't approach the cards from the perspective of divination. It approaches the cards really from, from an archetypal perspective, that the images on, on these cards function as archetypes, almost as icons that we can use in our spiritual practice, our meditation, to go deeper in our own spiritual journey. And so that's really what he means when he talks about a system of spiritual exercises. Now, I underline that because we're going to come back to this concept. This book, what I would say, is a book about how to exercise the contemplative imagination. So if you want one phrase to describe it, that's what I would say. It, the book demonstrates this faculty of the contemplative imagination using a language that may be unfamiliar to many, especially many Christian readers. The language of ceremonial magic, of tarot cards, and of the Western esoteric or hermetic tradition. Some of you may say, I don't even know what the word esoteric or the word hermetic means. Um, you know, it's, you, well, you read this book and you'll learn a lot about these traditions. But, but I just want to acknowledge that this is unfamiliar for many people who maybe are coming out of the Christian tradition. But that's part of, pardon the pun, the book's magic, is by taking two traditions that don't often talk to each other and connecting the dots, the author draws profound 
spiritual insight. The book applies the, the langu this, this language that's unfamiliar to many Christians to sacramental Christian spirituality in a surprisingly lucid and insightful way. And the book offers us new ways to think about familiar concepts and is fascinating and at times even breathtaking in its implications. I should mention right now, this is not just mere theory, that this, is, um, this book takes us beyond just ideas to think about. Uh, the author writes this, it's a, it's a series of letters, 22 letters, and he, he describes them as letters to an unknown friend. And so I think he's standing in the tradition of other kind of mystical masterpieces in the Western tradition, like the Cloud of Unknowing from England in the 1300s, or the Interior Castle from Spain in the 1500s from St. Teresa of Avila. The, um, these books and many other books in our tradition were written in this kind of mentoring way. The writer was speaking sometimes to even just one person or maybe to a community of nuns or to a church or to a, to a community of faith. This author is writing in that same spirit. It's, it's, there's a friendly tone to this book, a tone of, I want to share with you my lifetime of wisdom and in the hopes that it will be a blessing for you too. So the author sees these images of the Tarot. There are 22 images called the major arcana, the major secrets. He sees these images as each one inviting us into a particular kind of spiritual exercise. For example, you notice this is card number one. Uh, in English, this, is, this card is called the magician. It's also sometimes called the juggler. The author suggests, and in the very first letter, he suggests that this invites us into a spiritual exercise of relaxed concentration as a prelude to all the other exercises. And why, what immediately struck me when I read this is that it reminds me of centering prayer. It reminds me of so many of the contemplative practices that are part of the Christian tradition that have that same kind of aim of bringing us into concentration, into awareness, but in a relaxed and, um, and kind of open-hearted way, again, as a prelude to going deeper in our spiritual life. Now, the thing to keep in mind, he writes this book in the 1960s. The contemporary centering prayer movement emerges in the 1970s. So he wouldn't have been familiar with that specific movement, but he's certainly familiar with this, the concepts coming out of our tradition, the same kind of concepts that then informed the centering prayer movement. I'm going to just throw a few quotes out at you, and I am going to read these quotes because I know we have some people on the call who don't have video access. The major arcana of the Tarot, are they not a call to the winged imagination within a framework and a direction proper to each of them? They are symbols, like I mentioned earlier, they're like archetypes. But what does one do with symbols if not apply the inspired imagination to them? So he's inviting us to engage with these symbols, to use our imagination. Really the closest thing I can think of to compare it to is like praying with an icon. He is suggesting that these, these 22 symbols have an iconic function for those of us who wish to go deeper in our spiritual lives today. An arcanum, something which one has to take hold of and apprehend beyond the usual plane of experience and thought. This invites us to profound meditation, to a spiritual exercise. Let us follow this invitation. So once again, he's emphasizing this isn't just a book of theory. This is an invitation into spiritual practice, into the practice of meditation, of contemplation, of exercises that are designed to help us grow deeper in our prayer life. Here's an, an example of a connection that he draws that I just thought was lovely and I just wanted, so I created this slide just to help to show how he connects the dots. Here is, is card number 16 uh, of the Major Arcana. In English, it's called the Tower. Uh, in French, the House of God, the Maison Dieu. And he, he pairs it with the Magnificat, with Mary's song from the first uh, chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And, and you can see this quote here that God has scattered those who have proud thoughts in their hearts and has put down the mighty from their thrones. So, so the author is inviting us to look at this image. The Tarot, the tarot is, it started as a secular card game. So these secular images 
and to see the resonance with the, the spiritual imagery from our, from our contemplative tradition, in this case, from the Song of Mary. That this, this idea, you can see the people falling off of the lightning struck tower, you know, cast down the mighty from their thrones. Just moving along again, trying to be quick because I have a lot of ground to cover here. For each arcanum insofar as it is an arcanum is not a doctrine, but rather an event, an event of opening the eyes, opening up of an inner sense which permits things to be seen in a new way. So the purpose behind these exercises is to learn to see the spiritual life in a new, new way. Intuition is the cooperation of human intelligence with superhuman wisdom. That just, let's just linger on that and savor that for a second. Intuition is the cooperation of human intelligence with superhuman wisdom. So when we are accessing our intuition, he's inviting us to consider that we are actually, our ordinary consciousness, including our subconscious, is dancing with the divine presence in our hearts. Uh, you know, for those of you who are, who are Christians, Romans 5.5, 5, the idea that the Holy Spirit is in our hearts. I think that's true for all people, not just, not just for people who've been baptized or people who go to church on Sundays, but for all of us, the divine spirit has been poured into our hearts. And the author here invites us to consider that that's the gateway to intuition. So the author invites us to revision spirituality. Part of the wonder of this book is how it revisions traditional uh, concepts, concepts from Christian history, from contemplative history. To give an example, he takes the, the three what are, are, are known as the, the, the uh, evangelical uh, vows or the religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and he offers a really fascinating new way to think of them. Poverty is the cultivation of inner emptiness. Chastity, the orientation of life toward love rather than toward consumption or addiction. Obedience, a commitment to freedom that runs deeper than the, uh, the ever-changing whims of personal desire. So here are words, I mean, words like chastity and obedience, sometimes, you know, it's easy to kind of push back against those words because of the connotations that they have carried over, really over the centuries. But the author here, using his contemplative imagination, invites us to fascinating new ways to take these, these ancient concepts, these ancient elements of spirituality, and to, and to rethink them in ways that are relevant to our day that I think is also faithful to the spirit of the tradition. And again, that's what I think is just so brilliant about this book. In meditation, and these letters are only meditations. It is a matter above all of the question posed in all honesty to our own conscience, answered in all honesty by our own conscience. What do I myself know? And not the question, what is generally known? What is he saying here? That there's more to spirituality than just learning lots of facts. There's more to spirituality than just getting, getting, you know, uh, getting well read in all the great mystics, the great saints, the theologians, the philosophers, biblical scholars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that there's anything wrong with any of the above, but he's saying all of that ultimately has to be filtered through the reality of our own experience, through, um, through the fact that prayer, meditation, contemplation, ultimately doesn't come out of a book. It's ultimately our heart in relationship with the divine heart. Once again, taking the, the three, what are known as the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, and just offering a beautiful new way to consider them. Faith is divine breath in the soul. Hope is divine light in the soul. Love is divine fire in the soul. So when we pray to open our hearts to ever increasing amounts of faith and hope and love, this is what we're praying for. This is what we're being offered. 
And I just had to throw in, you know, just as, as a final note, um, his, his beautifully succinct definition of mysticism. Uh, mysticism is a major theme of this book, of course, but he, he offers this wonderfully pithy definition. Mysticism is the awakening of the soul to the reality of the presence of God. Just reflect on that with me. The awakening of the soul to the reality of the presence of God. And that's what this book invites us into. Now, with all this praise, I also want to be balanced here and I want to acknowledge the challenges of this book. So just very briefly, we're gonna look at this. It is written in the 1960s and it shows its age. It does have problems. Uh, the language and the worldview are rigidly gendered. Uh, there will be elements in the book that could strike you as, as frankly, as sexist or as, you know, very chauvinistic from a masculine perspective. And, you know, my hope and my prayer is that if the author were writing today, he would temper some of that language. But I just have to acknowledge a book written in the 1960s, it still, it still has that, that limitation to it. The author it does have a generous heart and a generous soul, but he is a Catholic Christian, and at times he does come across as rather chauvinistic in his focus on, on, on Catholic spirituality. So, you know, some readers may just let that roll off. Others may find it makes them twitch. So, I just again, I just want to acknowledge that reality. Uh, the book is densely philosophical and, and, and luminous. There's brilliant, brilliant wisdom in this book. But at times, the author does seem to get lost in the weeds. At times, he, he can be frustrating in how abstract and how overly symbolic his language can become. I mention this to you because, of course, I hope you will read this book, even if you don't participate in my contemplative study program. I hope that you will, you will read this book and you'll bump into these things. And my, my invitation is that you persevere when you do, because two or three pages later, suddenly the wisdom will be flowing again. And you'll just be, you'll be highlighting and marking in your book or making notes like I do. I, you know, I keep notes on my Kindle. I, the, you know, I've been reading it over the last two months using the Kindle. And I think I'm, I'm up to 260 or 270 notes, not to mention all the highlights. That's just how, how, much I'm drawn into being in conversation with this book. So why, why should we read this book? Um, and so let me throw a quote to you from Thomas Merton. This comes from his, a book that was published after his death, An Introduction to Christian Mysticism. Merton says, the separation of theology from spirituality is a disaster. And, um, you know, I think the important thing here is that for much of our, our spiritual history, theology and spirituality were not seen as two separate things. It really has been a product of maybe the last few centuries. You know, theology has become more academic, more um, maybe abstract, more anchored in the university or in the seminary. Again, I don't want to criticize that. I think, you know, I read academic theology. I, I'm not an academic theolo theologian, but I love the wisdom that can be found there. But then what have we done? We've put spirituality off in the monasteries, in the retreat centers, and then increasingly just into people's private lives. And so Merton is saying prophetically, he's saying 60 years ago, this is a mistake to separate these two, that, that it leads to kind of a, you know, almost a, a split personality in, in the community of faith. And so with that problem, I'd like to suggest that Meditations on the Tarot is a book that goes a long way towards reintegrating theology, the stories of our faith, the, the wisdom, the ideas, the principles, the, the, um, the knowledge base that has shaped our community of faith generation after generation and generation to reunite that with the matters of the heart, with the disciplines of contemplation, of meditation, of prayer, of prayer practices, of Lectio Divina, and so forth. This is a book that invites us to bring these two together, to undo the disaster that bothered Merton. How do we do this? How do we, as individuals, reintegrate theology and spirituality? The Pope's not going to do it for us. The bishops or the conference ministers, you know, they're not going to do it for us. I think we as individuals, we have to reintegrate theology and spirituality in our own lives. And so 
what I think this book invites us to is a practice that combines prayer and meditation with the thoughtful engagement with the story of our faith and with the worldview of our faith. Reading the, a book like Meditations on the Torah can in itself be a spiritual practice. Here's another quote that I just think is really worth reflecting on. Um, Andrew Luth, a British Orthodox theologian, he looks like he's Gandalf's younger brother. Um, he writes, and he's an academic theologian, he writes, the purpose of theology is to safeguard against misunderstandings that frustrate the life of prayer. Why do we have theology? Why are there theology departments? Why are there seminaries? Why are there biblical scholars and theologians generation after generation reflecting on the wisdom of our faith to support all people that we can grow deeper in our prayer, to help us to pray more clearly, more heartfully, more, more um, freely. So again, I think reading Meditations on the Torah, obviously it's not the only book that can do this, but it is one book that can, that can, can tickle our brains, can, can help us to grow in wisdom, even while it supports us in our life of prayer. But how to read it. And um, like many mystical classics, it's not a book to be read quickly or superficially. I have had several people ask me over the last few weeks when you know it's gotten around online that I'm developing a course on this book. And it's like, is this gonna be four weeks? Is this gonna be six weeks? Is this gonna be like a weekend? And, and my response would be, no, that would be just skimming the service. It would not do this book justice. This book requires a deep dive. It requires lingering with the book. It requires not only study, but meditation. If you're familiar with Lectio Divina, the monastic practice of reading the Bible prayerfully, meditatively, contemplatively, uh, I want you to think that's kind of the, the spirit to bring to this book, that it, that it is a book that rewards being savored, being read slowly. We're going to come back to that word savored in just a minute. And so I am proposing an in-depth journey and my inspiration comes from another classic model of spiritual growth that many of you will be familiar with, and that is the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. The spiritual exercises, which I, I had the honor of doing the spiritual exercises several years ago, and this year, actually, for the first time, I'm actually uh, accompanying another person as she's making her spiritual exercises. Um, it's an amazing, amazing uh, spiritual process. Uh, Ignatius designed it to be an in-depth 30-day retreat, but 30 days where you're doing nothing but these exercises, focusing on drawing closer to Christ and diving deeper into the mysteries of, of the spiritual tradition. But even Ignatius in, in the 16th century, he acknowledged that many people don't have the resources, the time or the financial resources to run off for 30 days to a retreat center and just do these exercises. So he encouraged people to do what he called a retreat in everyday life. And by this, what he means is take an hour or 90 minutes a day, just take some time each day meet with your spiritual director maybe once a week or so, and take nine months or longer even to walk through this journey of, of deepening your spiritual life and deepening your faith. And so friends, I am proposing a walk with meditations on the Tarot that would follow this pattern. But since we're going to be starting in February, I'm going to suggest that we take the year, that we take 11 months. There are 22 letters in this book, two a month, that takes us 11 months. So it will begin in February and it'll run us through the end of the year. Here's a quote from a, from a critic who says that this book begs not only to be studied cover to cover, but also to be savored, meditated upon and assimilated into one's life. This I think gives us a hint as to how to approach this book. Um, so, we study the book. Yes, you know, read it with your mind. Read it to learn. There, there, that certainly is an important part of the process. What story is this book telling us? But then savor the wisdom. What insights does this hold for me? What do I feel called to linger over? Meditate. How does God meet me 
in this wisdom? How does this call me deeper into prayer? And then finally, assimilate. How does this invite me to grow and to transform? So, um, you know, study is, study is a beautiful thing. You know, academic study, just, just the normal way that we try to learn. You know, we read for information. We read to master a topic. You know, it's like learning a foreign language, you know, or, or learning algebra or something like that. You know, you, you want to master the material. Perfectly valid, perfectly important. But contemplative study is a different perspective. It's not reading for information, it's reading for formation. It's like, how does this material change me? How does this invite me to grow? How does this invite me to go deeper in my prayer life? So heisukia, a Greek word that means silence, but it means contemplative silence. That silence, I think, is an important part of a contemplative approach to study that we need silence when we read, but we also need silence when we enter into meditation. Uh, Lectio, I've already mentioned that, but this idea that as we read, we seek what arises from within. We seek how these words are calling, calling our interior lives, our hearts into deeper conversation with God. The concept of unknowing, which comes from, you know, the cloud of unknowing, which I mentioned earlier, uh, this idea that inner growth is, is not just about mastering all the facts or knowing all the answers, that actually stepping into wondering, stepping into unknowing, stepping into openness can be an important part of the process. And then finally, another Greek word for you, agape. Our priority is to respond to divine love as it manifests in our lives. So I am proposing a program that I'm calling the Contemplative Study of Mystical Writings, but of course, specifically this particular book. And originally, I thought this would just be a series of Zoom meetings, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, 350 people registered for tonight's program. I mean, you know, not many of them are not here because they live all around the world. So I've had a number of requests for an asynchronous program, a program that is not time specific. So what, what I am proposing is that I will create a monthly video to explore a theme from this book, and then also PDF study guides uh, correlated to each chapter. So a commentary outline, a guide to the chapter, a quotes that I will pull, that I will curate to help you in your own prayer, uh, to kind of just for your own reflection, and then an exercise. Now, the author does not, it's not like many books that are written today where, you know, the, at the end of the chapter, the author gives you a step-by-step -step exercise. Uh, Meditations on the Tarot is never that, that explicit. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of reading between the lines, but I will, I will curate my understanding of what the spiritual exercise is for each one of these chapters and then provide a PDF to you that you can use or not, you know, according to your own spirituality that can hopefully help you in, 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 your, you know, in your daily walk, in your daily prayer life. Uh, th this, this program will include a community discussion board on my website on anamkara.com, where you can interact with me and with the other participants in the program so that hopefully we can keep the conversation going, that uh, I, will, I will give us prompts with each chapter, each letter of the book, and then you know, we'll, um, we'll you know, just share with one another the insights and the wisdom that we we gain from this. But I still want to have monthly meetings. So once a month, we'll schedule a Zoom call. I know not everybody will be able to participate live, but we will record them for those who are not able, you know, either because of schedule or time zone. But for those who do want to really kind of be in conversation and kind of a contemplative dialogue in real time, we'll meet for 90 minutes. We will begin with centering prayer. So, so, so silence practice will be an important part of this process. We will pray together. And then out of that, we will, we will basically do kind of group spiritual companionship. We will, we will, I, you know, I will lead the conversation. I will come up with some material to kind of get the ball rolling, but it's not going to be so much me giving a lecture as all of us coming together and all of us listening for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So yeah, centering prayer, review of the material, and contemplative dialogue. So to, to summarize, 
What I'm talking about are 23 units because the book does have an introduction and an afterword. I'll cover both of those in the first unit. And then the 22 letters uh, running for 11 months, February through December, 12 videos. Uh, I will also strip the, uh, the visual and make audio files if you're more of a, a podcast kind of a person. A total of 67 PDFs, 23 study guides, 23 quotation and prayer prompts, and then just 21 exercises. And you'll find out why there's only 21 as you get deeper into the book. The community discussion board, and then 11 monthly Zoom meetings, which will be recorded for those who cannot attend in person. So I know you're wondering, okay, what is this gonna cost? And so, um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, this is the first time I've done something like this. So, so I've, I've done a little bit of research and talked to some people who know a lot more about online learning than, than I do. And the numbers that people quoted me, frankly, kind of blew me away. Um, people have suggested that programs like this typically will run anywhere from $400 to $3,000 or more. And I'm just like, whoa, and let me hesitate to say, I am not talking about, you know, we're going to go below that low end, okay? I'm, I'm not talking about those numbers, but I'm just sharing with you that that's what people have, have suggested me programs like this can run. If you did the spiritual exercises, the, the, the Ignatian spiritual exercises, they could easily cost you $800, $900 or more. So obviously programs like this do tend to come with a commitment. But you notice I have a picture of St. Benedict there. I follow the rule of St. Benedict, not as a monk, but as a lay associate. And the rule of St. Benedict has this little line in it. It says, avarice must have no part in establishing prices. So prices, when you, you know, talking to monks, but also to lay, lay sisters, your prices should always be a little lower than what people outside the monasteries are able to set. So friends, I have decided that the list price for this program will be $299. But I also have uh, an option that will cut the cost even further. And this involves a program that I have been using for several years now to support my blog as a program called Patreon. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with it. Patreon is, is a membership site for people who, uh, who want to support independent creative uh, professionals, writers, musicians, podcasters, uh, artists, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, Patreon is a wonderful service. And so as an independent writer, a freelance writer, Patreon has funded my blog now for over three years, over four years now. It's been a tremendous gift to me. And so I wanna partner this, this program with Patreon. So anyone who either currently is or who becomes a Patreon, a member of my Patreon uh, program at $20 a month or more, will have access to this program. And you get a 15% discount if you pay for a year up front. So it's actually $204 a year. So um, it, it, is a, it is a recurring fee. I'm gonna, you know, I wanna be honest about that, uh, but it's also, there's, there's no contract. So you can, you can cancel it at any time. If you decide this isn't, this isn't for you, uh, you, know, you do have that option. If you do go the Patreon route though, there are other benefits that will be available to you. For example, I do a quarterly online retreat day for my patrons. Uh, retreat days like that, I've seen it going for $60, $59, $60 a pop. So that right there is, has a value of over $200, but it's something that I like to do specifically for the people who, who are supporting my work. So um, also, you know, here, here's the little, but wait, there's more. If you do sign up before the end of this month, I will send you an autographed copy of my book, Answering the Contemplative Call. So it's just a little benefit for those of you who wanna sign up right away. So to register, here's the URL, I'll put it in the chat and I will email this out to you, anamkara.com forward slash M-O-T-T, Meditations on the Tarot. And um, you can choose either Patreon or the one-time payment option. Patreon, it'll send you to the Patreon page. I have different tiers for, for supporters. You choose the visionaries tier. That's the $20 a month or $204 a year. Once again, recurring fee, but you can cancel it at any time. Or you can, if you just, you don't wanna fool with a recurring fee, you can do the one-time payment option of $299, which you can do on my website. So either of those options are available to you. And finally, I just have to say this because I believe it, that no one should be excluded because of money. 
So if you are in a situation, you know, whether it be because of an employment issue, financial hardship, whatever, if there's a reason why you want to do this program, but, but the money is an obstacle, please email me. We will work something out. So I want, I want to make that offer. I want to be clear that partial scholarships can be available. But, um, but hopefully, for, the, for those of you who do feel like, like this would be a good value, I hope you'll consider you know, those first two options. Okay, and finally, I just want to mention that this is what I hope is the first of many. That, you know, remember that slide earlier where I showed you some other books that are wonderful, mystical books, but that are not easy reads. I would like to do deep dives of some of these too. In fact, I can already tell you if this course is a success, then in 2023, I want to do the Sermons of Meister Eckhart. And so if you are interested in having this kind of, of a contemplative program to support your ongoing prayer practice, then please, please, you know, well, participate this year and please, you know, stick around because I really do hope to do more. So yes, the book was originally written in French. It, in French, it has been translated in German and then in English. A fun fact, there is a photograph, you can find it online, of Pope John Paul II with the German edition of this book on his desk. Now, I don't know if that means he read it or not, but we do know that, that Cardinal Hans Urs von Balthasar, he wrote the afterword to the book and he and Pope John Paul were friends. So I think it is reasonable to speculate that even the Pope, even Pope John Paul II was a fan of this particular book. Um, let's see, so people have just posted some information about the Marseille Tarot. You can find the images online. I mean, all the images I used, I just grabbed them from the internet. It, it, the, the deck itself is in the public domain. There is a beautiful, you know, you can buy the deck. Uh, so I would suggest either downloading the images from online or going ahead and buying the deck. Uh, when you work with this book, because looking at the images in full color is, is definitely a help. Uh, I see we have at least one person from Germany here. Bless you for being here. I know it's the middle of the night for you, but thank, thanks, for, thanks for joining. People said um, it's worth the journey. Amen. You know, I am finishing my third read on the book, and of course I will read it again as we go through it for the rest of this year. So it'll be my fourth trip down the Yellowbrook Road. It, it's just, it's such an amazing book. I'm just excited to share this book with, with all of you. Um, people put some quotes up about the spiritual exercises. Yes, if you haven't done the spiritual exercises, it's another amazing, really life-changing, life-changing program that I would highly recommend. Um, so let's see what else. Is this an intro level course or should you have experience with other similar texts? Okay, wonderful question. I do not assume that, that anybody taking this will have any knowledge of the Tarot or any knowledge of kind of hermeticism or kind of the esoteric world. Um, with, with Christian spirituality, I think you can be a beginner on that side as well. The, um, the Zoom meetings, we will do centering prayer. And so I will make a point that at least at the first meeting, maybe, maybe the first couple of meetings, I will give instructions for centering prayer. I am a commissioned centering prayer presenter. So I, I kind of, I know the drill on how to teach people to do that. Centering prayer is a very simple, gentle way of praying, but it is challenging because it involves being attentive to silence in our hearts. And so, um, you know, as most of us know who've tried this way of praying, it's not easy because we have noisy hearts and we have noisy minds. And so centering prayer is an invitation to kind of sink through the noise, the, the monkey mind, as the Buddhists call it, and to find that silence deep within us. So I would say if you're a beginner, don't let that be a reason not, not, to, not to read this book or not to take the deep dive. But, um, but it, is, it, is, it is not just a beginner's book. It is a book that goes deep. And so I would say that, you know, that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I think you can count on being stretched by this book. You know, Thomas Keating, Bede Griffiths, Basil Pennington, these, these, these people were masters. They were masters of contemplative spirituality, and they were blown away by this book. So expect yourself to be blown away by it as well, no matter what level you might be at. 
what would the weekly time commitment be? That's a great question. Uh, probably not as heavy as the spiritual exercises. The book itself is 650 to 700 pages, depending on which edition you use. Um, so figure, you know, divide that by 11. So that's what, 60 to 70 pages a month. So that's two pages a day, which doesn't sound like a lot, but remember, you'll be reading this slowly. So, so you know, so allow, I would say allow 15, you know, minutes, 15 or more minutes for the reading. And then the exercise, I think that's really going to be up to you. Um, you know, we will have, we will have the Zoom call, we'll have the video, I'll have PDFs. It'll really be up to you how deep you want to go with all of that. Um, I would strongly encourage anybody who's doing this to have a commitment to daily prayer. It doesn't have to be centering prayer. You know, I'm a centering prayer person, but there are many other ways to pray. It could be, um, you know, it could, I mean, it could be the daily office. It could be the Jesus prayer. It could be Ignatian types of prayer, which uses the imagination. But the, the important thing is, is that you, you are giving yourself the gift of time where you're devoting your heart to your spiritual growth and your spiritual sustenance. And again, I'm coming out of the Christian tradition, so I use Christian language. Prayer is about communication with God. I know for some people, the word God can be a trigger word. If that's your case, please substitute with a, with a, with a word that for you captures the mystery of love. God is love with a capital L. And that's what we are putting ourselves in the presence of when we pray. So, so, so I would say, you know, that you could do this just, you know, with a minimal commitment, or you could go really deep, depending on, on your heart, you know, and, and the thing I will also mention is that, you know, I, you know, I, I want to be generous with this program. If you sign up for this, whether, whether you're paying monthly or you, you, you pay the full amount, um, I'm going to give you lifetime access to the course. You know, you're, 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 you, you get in and you can use the course. So if you don't finish it in 11 months, you can, you, can still, you can still come in and access the PDFs and access the videos. You know, I'll probably keep the course online even after, you know, December for people who come after the fact. They won't get the live Zoom meetings. That's only going to be for this year, but, um, but they can still access the material. So, so if you find, you know, life happens, if, if there's, you know, a reason that you need to pull back, the material will be waiting for you at a later date. So, um, so yeah, the book is available on yeah Kindle for nine ninety five. You know that I use the Kindle, but of course the 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 both paperback and the hardback. All three editions are wonderful. The hardback is only thirty five forty dollars for a hardback. That's really you know not a bad price, and it's beautiful. Um, show you the books. So here's you know here's the hardback. You can see there they're definitely thick books, but and then the paperback it retails for twenty two ninety five. You know, so obviously you can get these on Amazon, you know, or, or support your independent bookstore, which I think is so important. But, um, you know, and then, and then to be perfectly honest, you can find PDFs of the book online. So if you look around, you know, you can even, you can even grab the PDF and read it that way. The paper quality with the hardback, I think it's quite lovely. It doesn't have a dust jacket, but it has just a really beautiful cover. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's perfect bound. But it's 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 really nice. It's a it's it's not a hard type. I mean, again, you can see just how dense the book is. A lot of material. But um, you know, I don't have the best eyes, and and it's it's not hard for me. So I think I think it's fairly easy to use. Um, of course, the Kindle. That's what's great about the Kindle. You can blow it up if you need to. What day of the week will we have the Zoom call? I'm assuming Thursday nights. I can't do Tuesdays and I can't do Wednesdays because I have standing commitments those evenings. So, um, so the first one will definitely be February 10th, but we can also, you know, I can, I can open up a poll. If people find that Thursday nights is just impossible, we could look at the weekends. We could even look during the day. You know, I, I, I'll try to find the time that is the most accessible. We may even try different times, which means that different people will be able to do them, but hopefully over the long run, that, that might be the most helpful. So, um, Somebody says I'm generous, you know, thank you, because I think that's part of being a spiritual person. I think we're called to a spirit of generosity, but, um, but also, you know, what's in it for me? I mean, obviously, I'm hoping you'll support my ministry, you know, just to be perfectly frank, but also, 
I want to grow spiritually, you know, so, so I'm, I'm coming into this not only to share with you some of my perspective, but also to learn from you as well, that, that I believe that, that, that all of us can bless one another, and we can all learn together to go deeper in our journey, so I'm really excited about that, so, um, okay. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Oh, it's after eight. Okay. I, I, I want to I wanna respect people's time. So, so we need to wrap this up. But um, um, just the, the, author, the author of the book is, is published anonymously. It is widely recognized that the author was a Russian person named Valentin Tomberg. And he actually lived in England. He was, a, he was a, a, an immigrant to England. After World War II, he worked for the BBC as a translator. So he lives this very ordinary life. And yet he, he has this deep interior life. He had been involved again with kind of the esoteric world from his youth. And then in midlife, he embraces Catholic Christianity and goes really deep in the contemplative world as well. Writes this book towards the end of his life. He dies in 1973. In the book, he makes a couple of references to 1965, 1966. So we know the book was written in the mid 1960s. So, you know, towards the end of his life uh, and certainly um, just, you know, uh, manifesting a breadth of knowledge, a lifetime worth of knowledge that he is distilling and sharing with us. So, um, so how long would the calls be? I'm assuming 90 minutes. Figure the first 30 minutes will be for centering prayer. You know, probably a brief introduction, maybe review of the guidelines of centering prayer, then 20 minutes of silence. Then we'll move into, I will prepare some material to kind of get the conversation going. Um, you know, of course, we'll have the material, the PDFs that I will have been sharing as well. And then moving into dialogue. Into, um, into more contemplative, more reflective dialogue with each other, but then trying to finish within 90 minutes. So. Yes, if you're already a, a patron, you can, you can just bump your, your, your tier up. Somebody asked, you know, can I upgrade my membership level? Yes, there are three different tiers that I currently have available on my Patreon page. If you are already a, pa a Patreon supporter at $20 or more, um, then you, you have access to this course, okay? But if you're if currently you're you know, pay, giving $3, $5, $10 or whatever, just, just upgrade to that $20 and then you get the access as well. Or if you're brand new, you know, again, go ahead and sign on to that $20 level. So, um, so I'm, I'm intimidated. Oh, don't be intimidated, my friend. It, 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 yes, it is difficult, but, but it's, not, it's not impenetrable. There is, there is much about this book that is lucid and luminous. And yes, that is what I see as my role in terms of the PDFs that I will be creating is to really try to provide like a user's guide. So um, I can't explain everything about these books because there's a lot in here that I'm still learning as well. But hopefully, hopefully I, I have enough of a sense of the lay of the land that, that I will be able to, to give you points of entry that will enrich your experience with the book. Thank you, that was a wonderful question. People are saying they have to leave and I acknowledge that. Uh, friends, please pray about this. Hopefully I'll see you in February. We'll be starting in early February. But again, if, if you sign up before the end of January on Patreon, I'll send you an autographed book. Uh, and with that, uh, let me just offer a brief prayer and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's just, it, it's, it's, it's exciting to me to see so many people who are interested in this kind of spiritual depth. So I'm going to close us with a prayer from Julian of Norwich. And I invite you to, to, to pray with me. Oh, God of your goodness, give us yourself for you are enough for us. We can ask for nothing less that is fully to your honor. And if we were to ask anything less, we would always be in want. It is only in you that we have all. Joyfully we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, my friends. Good night.